This video is sponsored by Cord. More on them later. The one and only Yeti, Wax Quippinger, possesses unfathomable strength, extreme knowledge from his years of immortality, and speaking of immortality, how is Skips immortal? In a physical setting, you know, aside from all the magic. Skips isn't just some park groundskeeper, but an immortal legend whose name he himself will write in the history books. Starting off as always, let's take a look at the physics of Skips to quantify his physical power before looking at some of his basic biochemistry. Now, instead of focusing on the entire series, I took a random sample of episodes and chose the three scenes I personally saw as the most awe-inspiring. Those scenes being Skips sending Chlorgbane to the moon quicker than NFTs, killing Rigby and arm wrestling death, and in the first episode, holding down the entire park gang. Starting from the beginning, let's look at the math and physics behind Skip sending Chlorbane to space One Punch Man style. Now, first, to even find how an object would possibly even make it to space, we'd have to calculate the speed required to escape the Earth's gravitational field. Now, first off, to even move away from the Earth, you'd have to apply a force stronger than the force of gravity. Lucky for us, the force of gravity between two objects will be proportional to the mass of the object that is trying to escape the Earth's gravitational field, the mass of the Earth, the square of the radius between the center of mass of the two objects and the gravitational constant. This would give us the force between the Earth and the object. With this, however, since the R component is continually decreasing all the way to infinity, which is the point at which the gravitational field strength of the Earth is zero, and then as such, our problem starts involving types of differentials and integrals since R is continually changing. Then there would be some df over some small distance increase dr. Then as such, the force must also be decreasing and changing and thus the initial velocity to be found gets more convoluted and difficult due to the differential nature of this equation. But no worries, we can solve this problem by first integrating, then solving, then setting up our equation and it's all useless. Instead of doing flashy math to try and impress people, let's just get the answer instead. Let's use the conservation of energy to find how much force skips would have to hit Chlorbane with to send him to space. Now, the initial energy of the earth Chlorbane system, the millisecond after he is hit, is the initial kinetic energy of Chlorbane, plus the initial gravitational potential energy between Chlorbane and the earth right before Chlorbane is launched. And this would be equal to the final energies of Chlorbane, which is the kinetic energy of Chlorbane since he is still moving, and once he is out of the gravitational field influence of the earth, because his distance from the earth would have to be infinity for him to escape the gravitational field of the earth. With this gravitational potential energy being zero, our conservation of energy equation would then become the initial energy equals the final energy, and the initial energy is kinetic energy initial plus gravitational potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final. And then, substituting in values, we have one half mass of Chlorbane times the initial velocity of Chlorbane squared plus negative g mass of the earth mass of Chlorbane divided by r equals one half velocity final squared times the mass of Chlorbane. Wait, Chordbane? Sounds a lot like the sponsor of this video, Chord. Do you like keyboards? I do. They make nice clicking sounds, and also typing stuff or whatever. Would you like to build your own keyboard? Oh, you wouldn't? Well, that's fine too. Because with Chord, you can buy pre-made keyboards or accessories for your mechanical keyboard, from keycaps to switches, and if you do want to build your own keyboard, well, with Chord, it's never been easier. Simply purchase the kit and have it delivered right to your door. Then, enjoy building your own keyboard. So what are you waiting for? Go to Chord.fun and enjoy the wide selection of keyboards and keyboard accessories from Chord. Use code Zersol at checkout for 20% off your order at Chord.fun. Thank you, Chord. Now, where were we? Oh, that's right, solving for the initial velocity. Solving for the initial velocity, which is required to find the force Skips puts onto Chlorgbane to send him to the moon, would come out to this equation for Chlorgbane as he gets bonked. Velocity initial equals the square root of the final velocity squared, plus 2 g mass of the earth divided by the radius initially. Now, as such, finding the final velocity of Chlorgbane becomes somewhat of a tricky process as the distance traveled is unknown. The final velocity is unknown, but the time it took him to reach the velocity is known. And since final velocity is required to calculate the initial velocity, which is required to find Skips' force, we need to solve for this value. Now, let me take you through my thought process here. As we see Chlorgbane disappearing, objects get smaller due to them taking up less of the human's field of vision. Assuming this is from Skip's reference point, as he smacks Chlorgbane initially, Chlorgbane takes up all of his field of view, and the length would be assumed to be 1 meter. 
Now, as Chlorgrain disappears, the amount of space he takes up in Skips' FOV is a fraction of the total FOV for Skips. Through doing some calculations, the ratio of the field of view that Chlorgrain takes up of Skips is originally 100%. And to find the final amount of FOV Chlorgmine takes up of Skips' FOV, let's turn to the little, brightest part of the so-called star. This star is the heat Chlorgmine experiences, and as such, Chlorgmine is literally on fire. And so, turning to the brightest part of this fire, the amount of space on Skips' screen that Chlorgmine takes up is the original area under the area of the light. The area of the light being 3 mm squared, and the total area is 132 times 240 mm squared. Therefore, the total fraction that Chlorgrain takes up of Skips' FOV is now 3 over 132 times 240 mm squared, a lot less than the original FOV Chlorgrain took up. Since the FOV of someone is shaped like a cone, we can divide this cone up into 2D right triangles and then set the angle of this triangle to be theta the opposite side from this angle to be Chlorgbane's height over 2, and the adjacent side to be the distance from Chlorgbane. Solving for this initial angle, theta, the distance from Skips to Chlorgbane is 1 meter. This distance is estimated as the length of Skips' arm. Since Skips is around the same height as Mordecai, Mordecai, who is around 1.905 meters, and since the arm span of an individual is around the same as their height, we can approximate this arm span to consist of just the arms and not the chest. And then as such, dividing by 2, the arm length of skips is around 0.975 meters. And when approximating to a meter by accounting for the extra length of skips' arms, we can assume skips' arms are 1 meter. Anyways, the initial angle theta can be found using trigonometry. We have the opposite side and adjacent side. The adjacent side being skips' arm of 1 meter, and the opposite side is equal to half the height of chlorgmine, which is around 1.35 meters, and thus the tangent of theta equals opposite side over adjacent side equals 1.35 divided by 1. And then the angle theta is just the arc tangent of 1.35, which gives us a theta value for skips' FOV to be 4.46 radians. Now, applying the same logic, the amount Chlorgmane takes up of the FOV of Skips before he is launched to space is now the fraction 3 over 132 times 240. And thus, Chlorgmane's height should have shrunk by the same amount, assuming no angles because it would make the math unnecessarily complicated. The height of Chlorgmane, or the opposite side of the triangle, is then the original length times 3 over 132 times 240. With this now, we need to find the distance of Chlorgmane from Skips, or the adjacent side relative to some new angle I'll call P. With this now, we can either use the tangent, or we can find the length through the Pythagorean theorem. Now, the problem here is that we don't have any value aside from the opposite side from the angle P. So, instead, let's set up an equation like this. L, the final length, equals tangent of theta x which will give us a whole array of solutions, an infinite amount. So as such, our solution will lie somewhere on this graph, and can be found if we just find the angle or the hypotenuse. We can do this a multitude of ways, he thought calmly as he wasted the paper in his notebook. But I'll choose to set up a system of equations with the solution x on the right side and the angle and the distance on the other sides. Through this, we can create a system of equations and that won't work. What about if we find the derivative as the side that is getting farther away is shrinking and nope, that won't work. What if we set up a nonlinear system of equations? No. What if we- Bro, stop trying! So, yeah. <laughs> that ended up being a failure and a waste of notes. Good to know. Anyways, let's just assume that he sent Chlorgbane around 1,000 kilometers. Seems reasonable enough, right? Let's just use the good old basic simple kinematics formula to find the initial velocity of Chlorgbane, which, when solving for the initial velocity, is 100,000 minus 0.5 times 10, times 1.88 squared divided by 1.88, which equals around 53,000 meters per second, making everything we just did completely useless. Now moving on. So yep, that's right. All we had to do was do that. <sighs> you know, something just doesn't feel right doing this. What if we instead take the volume of the cone that is formed when an observer is watching to be constant when stretched? Then, if we set the initial volume of the cone, which is pi over 3, equal to the final volume of the cone, which should also be pi over 3, times 0 0.00009 r squared times h, and then solve for h, and we finally found it, obamium.
I mean, the distance skip sent cloak me, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine meters. This satisfies our previous equation of 0 0.00009 equals tangent of xy. As substituting in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, in for the y coordinate, this value is on the graph of 0 0.00009 equals tangent of xy, with an x coordinate of 7.23 times 10 raised to the minus 12th radians, which is how small the angle of FOV is. Now, with this, the acceleration at this point on Chlorgbane from the Earth is just 0 0.028 meters per second squared. And initially, this was 10 meters per second squared. And this changes in just 1.88 seconds, giving us an average acceleration of 5.305 meters per second squared for this movement. Although the acceleration does drop off exponentially, we'll take the linear case and ignore the exponential case for now. Now, with the acceleration found, let's go back to finding our initial velocity, and this time we can make use of the equations we had before for the initial velocity. With the initial velocity being equal to the square root of the final velocity squared plus 2 gm over r, the final velocity will just be equal to the initial velocity plus at. Now, substituting in this for the final velocity, then squaring both sides, and expanding the term in the square, we have vi squared equals vi squared plus 2 atvi plus a squared times t squared plus 2 gm divided by r. And then, finally, when solving for the initial velocity of Chlorgbane, we have that vi equals negative a squared t squared plus 2 gm over r divided by 2 at. And since the average acceleration is just negative 5.305 meters per second squared, and the time is 1.88 seconds, the distance from the center of the Earth is 6,371 kilometers, we can find the initial velocity to be 3,333,433.677 meters per second, close to a hundredth of the speed of light. And the initial force on Chlorgbane from skips would be, again, with Chlorgbane's mass being around 1,717 kilograms as approximated by using the human's density and then assuming Chlorgbane to be a cylinder with height 2.7 meters and radius 2.7 over 6 meters, the force skips applies to send Chlorbane this high with a contact time around 0.01 seconds through 0.08 seconds, ranges from 5.72 times 10 raised to the 11th newtons all the way to 7.154 times 10 raised to the 10th newtons. As an editor's note, to find out the power that skips used to send Chlorbane this far in this amount of time, we take the momentum and then multiply the velocity and then divide by 2 times the time. And this comes out to about 9.5 times 10 raised to 17 watts. Now, after that roller coaster, let's find the minimum force required to kill Rigby. Let's assume the minimum force to kill Rigby is the same as the force when Rigby falls a distance of a certain height. Please be aware. The next words refer to a sensitive topic. Viewer discretion is advised. Through some disturbing statistics, the median height at which a fatal force was impacted onto people from some height was around 23.6148 meters. Now, of course, as always, instead of making things simple and assuming that air resistance is negligible, let's instead factor in air resistance into our equation. Since this object will not be at terminal velocity, the force will thus be F net equals Fg minus F air. Now, solving for the velocity of the object through a differential equation, which we won't go into the steps of because there are too many, and instead, let's use the results found from our previous video and substitute this in. As such, our equation for velocity for an object which is shaped like a human has the same mass as an average human, same drag coefficient at everything, but is not a human, would come out to be an equation like this. h of x equals the square root of the square root of cg over 1 plus c e raised to the fourth square root cg x squared minus g minus g times e raised to the fourth square root cg x divided by 1 plus c times e raised to the fourth square root cg x minus square root cg over 1 plus c e raised to the fourth square root cg x and however this equation is useless because we don't have velocity we have distance and we did more work for no reason than <laughs> Oh wait, we can just integrate velocity. Integrating this velocity function, we have the distance function with air resistance and then as such, the distance someone falls and their subsequent velocity can be found. Using this equation, when the object which is not a human but has human-like properties, has these coordinates when it has fallen 23.6 meters, the median fatal distance fallen for most people. These coordinates become 3.607, which is our time coordinate, and around 23.6 meters. As such, our time is 3.607 seconds 
and the velocity at this point is around 14.4 meters per second. A contact time with concrete is around 0.001 seconds, thus the force is around 720,000 newtons on Rigby to kill him. The momentum is around 14.4 times 50 equals 720 newton seconds for this object. Since Rigby weighs closer to 20 kilograms, the speed skips must move Rigby is now 36 meters per second, and the power of this would be around 720 times 36 divided by time, and with a time of around 1 second, we have a power of 26,000 watts to kill Rigby. Now, as for Skip's arm wrestling with death, there are many, many, many unknowns, aside from a few, and we'll find those few unknowns. As such, those being Skip's making the table fly and then creating light, which may just be some non-physical death anime stuff, so let's ignore that and instead focus on Skip's making the table fly, if it is all just Skip's, with no contribution from death. The force to overcome is the force of gravity, which is equal to the mass of the two people, which we'll assume is 170 kilograms combined as a normal humanoid death should have a mass of around 70 kilograms. Don't ask how I found that out. And a jacked bodybuilder with a pristine physique like Skip's should have a mass closer to 100 kilograms. And as such, the force on the two is around 1700 newtons by gravity. Skip's would have to create a force which opposes this, a lift force, to be able to lift the table. And although the two are arm wrestling parallel to the floor, they move upwards, which concludes that a force applied parallel to the floor results in Skip's having the table move up. Lift force must always act perpendicular to the floor, and as such, Skip's force is infinite in this battle, or is this the work of the Playco arm boy? Now, finally, let's find Skip's holding down the part gang from the other force of the Black Wind, which is again just him pulling them down and to the right. The force of these winds would be the same as the force of air resistance assuming all things constant. Now, with this, the force of air resistance for a tornado like this, which has wind speeds of around 370 miles per hour on the high end, would have a force of 33,350.625 newtons. And since Skips must counteract this force, his force must be equal to 33,350.625 newtons to keep the entire park gang static and unmoving. Now, aside from his enhanced physique, that isn't the only thing which Skips has. His enhanced biochem and biology allows Skips to have survived for this long, allowing him to gain a substantial amount of knowledge. Now, how exactly is Skips immortal, aside from the magic? Aging is a process which occurs in all of us, and is the sad truth for all of us. Except Skips, of course. Aging occurs when the telomeres of the chromosomes shorten and when the cells become damaged, and we can't produce more cells than the cells that die, and as such, we start to age and our lifespan decreases. As for Skips, both of these qualities would have to be false, because he's immortal. He may age in the traditional sense, but he won't ever die unless he chooses to or is killed. But regardless, what Skips was granted was the ability for his cells to regenerate faster than they are destroyed and his telomeres, the ends of his chromosomes, to never shorten, allowing him to have literally immortal cells, assuming he never sustains any damage to any of his body, which he does sustain and still lives furthermore which means Skips has enhanced regenerative abilities too, although slow. He may always regenerate to full health owing to his immortality. Now, another factor to consider would be that Skips can absorb electricity and not die, probably owing to his immortality and that he doesn't need oxygen either as when on the moon, and then again neither do the rest of the park gang. What this means is Skips not needing oxygen makes him a fun guy, you know, pizza toppings. A fun guy in the sense Skips doesn't go through aerobic respiration, but rather Skips performs anaerobic respiration and is able to live without oxygen in the traditional sense. With this, an added factor would be that Skips, who's been alive for 200 years, has increased endurance and crystallized intelligence. Skips Quippinger isn't just some random yeti, you know, from those stories people tell. He's a Chad Boomer with impeccable physique and enhanced strength and access to magic. If it weren't for Skips, who knows where the park would be now? Huh? <laughs>